Oops. <laughs> All right. Uh, my name is James Paulson, and I am the proud board chair of uh, Frog, Friends of Frog Ferry. The board is made up of a very passionate and engaged group of um, board members. My fellow board members, a couple of them are here. I see Allison is here. And one thing about our board, um, I just want to make sure that everyone is very clear on. We are a very hands-on board, meaning that everyone that's on the board has um, other engagement um, kind of roles that they play. For instance, like I, mine is with uh, community outreach, which I am very passionate about. And uh, so I engage with the community outreach as well as uh, work around our community benefits plan. Um, so that's kind of my extra piece along with my role as board chair um, in how we, with just the myriad of things that go into um, meeting um, all the requirements that are, with all the stuff involved with pulling this ferry system off, working with, with Susan and all of her team. Um, now, what community outreach is just one of the teams. We have, I think it's six other teams that are made up of volunteers. And I wanna make sure that everyone understands that there is a lot of people and a lot of energy that goes into all the work that you're seeing here today. Um, what we're gonna do tonight is we're gonna do um, an overview of what's going on. We're gonna get into some of our marketing as well as get into some of our um, passenger experience. So with that, I would like to turn it over to our amazing team of women led by Susan. Uh, what is her name? <laughs> Glad home. Poor for you. I mean, <laughs> poor James. He's so <laughs> over here for me. <laughs> I've only been working on it for four years. <laughs> so let me turn it over to Susan, who could lead us in the uh, overview. That's great. James, thank you so much for your leadership and your passion. And I noticed that um, Paul Broder um, it joined the call as well. And Paul leads the ferry service operations up in King County out of Seattle. And tomorrow night, the Frog Ferry Board has its annual meeting. This is the third meeting. And Paul will be joining us as a new board member. And we were on a call with some global ferry leaders today and um, everyone was singing Paul's praises. He's just such a, a national, let alone global leader in the ferry space. So we have an amazing group of very talented people on our board and, and really look forward to welcoming um, Paul on. Um, thank you all for making the time tonight. I am so grateful to you. I have to say um, this outreach experience working with volunteers and passionate citizen, citizens like you is so incredibly re rewarding. It's for me, it really fuels um, my drive. It inspires me every day. And I just hear from so many of you, honestly, every day with suggestions. I've had a flurry of emails just come through regarding Congressman DeFazio's um, departure. The, the fact he's announcing his retirement. You know what, I'm gonna ask everyone to go ahead and mute besides me for right now. Of course, I just love being the only one that has the mic right now. now. There you go, then I won't get that feedback. Um, so quickly for our agenda, thank you, James, for the introduction. I'm very quickly going to um, really try to frame where we've been and where we've go we're going. And so I'm, I am going to be showing a slide that you guys have seen over and over again, but I just think it's really important to hold us all accountable to the timeline that we've set and to track together the progress. But really, tonight is focused on welcoming and hearing the work of um, Amy Snyder, who is our new vice president of marketing. And um, Amy joined the team. We were introduced last February. Um, she and her husband and family are fairly recent transplants from Atlanta. 
Um, she has a, about 25 years of experience in corporate marketing. And she said, hey, do you want me to take a look at your website and do an audit? And I was like, sure. And I got the most magnificent report back of how we could improve the website. So really looking forward um, to hearing from Amy and the work she's been doing with Sockeye Creative. And also we'll be hearing from Heather Lynn. And Heather and I worked together over 20 years ago um, when I was with the Port of Portland. She was with Sockeye and she has recently left her high tech job um, and will be joining us full time here, especially once we get full funding. So coming on board as a consultant to us has extensive experience in um, customer experience and, um, and brand work as well. And so the three of us have been having a number of conversations about strategy. We've got a full day next week. We've got another a, kind of a team building and personal styles exercise. And uh, two and a half weeks ago, we were back in New York for the, the ferry conference. Um, and then we'll kind of wrap things up with here are the highlights of really our key goals for 2022. And then we really do want to leave um, about 15 minutes for question and answer. So please, please, please um, take some notes and, and pepper us with questions. The harder, the better. So next slide there, Amy. We're going to talk a little bit about our, the, our mission statement just to keep everyone grounded here. And um, so just a general reminder for those of you that haven't seen this slide, our intention has been for almost five years now to have a public ferry service. That is what we're really trying to do. And that's why it's a very complex road we've undertaken because in order for it to be a public ferry service and to be able to keep ticket prices low, it does mean um, working with a local public agency we as a nonprofit cannot directly apply for particularly federal funds. And the Federal Transportation Administration, also known as the FTA, has a pot of money every year dedicated to ferries. And so we just got a grant application in, and I'll be talking about that in just a minute. And then now with this infrastructure bill, several of you have emailed me, hey, is Frog Ferry gonna be able to tap into this? Well, we certainly hope so. There's $348 million earmarked in this transportation budget specifically for ferries. So how can we get a, a piece of that? And then there are four really core areas of objectives that we really rally around. And so education is a, a core aspect of that. Um, health for our community, and there are many ways we define that and many ways we can help Im improve um, our, our health and livability. The environment is core for us. And, um, and Amy's gonna be talking a little bit about some of the, the takeaways um, from the ferry conference and, um, and definitely the focus on reducing greenhouse gas emissions is what all ferry operators globally are really talking about. And then the efficiency of a public-private partnership. Um, we've looked at a lot of different case studies around the, the world. Um, particularly out of San Francisco, they, they started their ferry service only 22 years ago in response to the La Brea earthquakes as a public-private partnership. So we've been taking these best practices and learning from a number of ferry experts for how we've charted our, our path forward. Um, and then um, this last one is really the iconic presence on the water, getting people out to the water to experience the city from that perspective. Um, is very important to us. It's all about river health. It's about reducing um, stress. And it's um, getting people to recognize that Portland and Vancouver were founded as river cities on the confluence of two rivers. So why don't we have um, better access to our river systems? Next slide. So here's the, the slide that we have been using for about four years now. So looking at phase one, that was 2017 to 2020. We did a lot of research, a lot of outreach, especially with um, James' help. Um, we got our governance in place. This is when we put together our nonprofit and we chartered our board. And those studies are the studies that the public transit agency said 
before we're going to help you out, you need to raise the funds for and conduct these and make sure that all of the findings of the study show, in fact, this is feasible and is, in fact, cost effective. And that has been true for all those studies. Um, and the pro bono contribution as of June of 2021 was in excess of $7 million of uh, professional service providers stepping in to help out. And without them and that commitment, there is no way we would be here today. We're now solidly in the middle of phase two, and that really is focused on getting a pilot project, a test, if you will, out on the water. One vessel, and I'll get into a little bit more detail on this, but it's the planning, which has really been 2021, the planning on that. We got the pilot project plan completed and turned into ODOT in September. And then we have an operations plan that's due here in another six weeks or so. The solicitation of federal funding and then putting vessels on order next year um, with the intention of starting our ferry operation the second quarter or spring of 2023. The total amount of money we need for the next three years is 9.7 million. If any of you have questions about that or want to see the pro forma, happy to do that. We have a lot of detail and a lot of rigor behind it. And, and candidly, I'm really proud of it. I can say that because I didn't work on it a whole lot. It's mostly John Sainsbury, our ferry consultant, but um, financial oh, experts that take a look at it are very impressed by the work that's mm -hmm. gone into that. And, and then I've got somebody here that I can hear you. I'm trying to see who that is just to make sure maybe Liz, there you go, thank you. And then for phase three is the vision, right? For seven vessels across 10 different stops in the future. And um, next slide, we're gonna see those stops. So Amy's gonna click on the, there you go, the arrow button. So this is this wonderful animated map that Sockeye created, put together for us that really shows the future vision for these 10 different stops. For those of you who are new to Frog Ferry, you may take a look at this map and think, oh, they're gonna start in Vancouver and then they're gonna stop all the way along the way. And it's gonna take me all day to get down to downtown Portland. And that is not the case for a ferry service. When you think about seven vessels, it gives you a lot of flexibility for the schedule. So we would be running some express services. Some of those vessels would be coming from Oregon City or Lake Oswego or Milwaukee to Portland or heading all the way north up to Vancouver. Um, some of the, the ferries could just be crisscrossing the river. We may have more of a focus on that midday or particularly on Saturdays, like to take families to OMSI. So I think it's really important to understand they're kind of the, the three different dimensions here. It's not just taking a look at a, a, a flat map and going, oh gosh, you have to stop all the way along the way. And I think the reason Portlanders think that way is because we have buses and we have light rail and you are on a fixed route for those when you really think about it. You know, buses can divert somewhat but mostly they're on the same schedule with the same bus stops. Ferries are far more modular and far more flexible that way and far more able to respond to demand. And for the next slide, is really the focus on the pilot project. So for that second quarter of 2023, we're really focused on building out two existing docks, one at Cathedral Park. So for those of you who may need a landmark, it's right at the base of the St. John's Bridge with that beautiful, beautiful bridge, oh. the most beautiful bridge in Portland. Um, from there down to, uh, it's called River Place, down at the South Waterfront. So using existing docks, so that way we're not tied up in a lot of permitting and, and um, design engineering of new docks. We wanna use existing infrastructure as much as possible. Um, and we really wanted to focus on a built-in audience. And so that built-in audience really um, is what ties us to these two points. Out of Cathedral Park and St. John's, we know that 87% of people commuting to work are driving single occupancy vehicles. We know for those that are taking transit, like a bus, they don't have light rail there, but taking a bus, 
to go seven miles, whether it's down to OHSU or whether it's going to PSU is over an hour. I mean, even for riding a bike, it's a pretty difficult um, route um, to take. Um, so we know Cathedral Park and St. John's is very underserved. We also know that there um, is a large historically marginalized population in that area. And, um, and we know on the other side of this route is OHSU, which is one of Oregon's largest employers. Um, Pre-COVID, there were 500 employees a day commuting from Cathedral Park and St. John's down to OHSU. During COVID, it's about 300. And for PSU, the, the PSU staff tell us it's about 400 faculty, students and um, staff who are making the, the commute. And so it's a pretty easy connection from River Place um, by bike or by scooter. Um, and I think that leads me to the other area that's really key for this routing is what's called the first and final mile. How will people get to the dock at Cathedral Park as well as when they arrive home at the end of the day back to their homes? And how will people arrive at River Place and get to their final destination? And so we have basically a business case for each one of the stops. At Cathedral Park, we've been working with leaders of the neighborhood associations there. Um, they would really like to put in a, an electric trolley um, to go through the neighborhoods to pick folks up, to bring them down um, to the dock. We really want to mitigate the need for parking. The whole idea is to get people out of their cars. So we're looking at scooters, personal bikes, e-bikes, and that's true down at the South Waterfront as well, looking at shuttles and, um, and also looking at the schedules even for the tram. What are the peak times for employees arriving at OHSU? So that's really why we focused on um, this route to get us started. We do plan on starting the pilot project with a diesel engine. And I know we just had someone write to the Portland Tribune a letter to the editor and saying, that's a travesty, you should be starting with an electric ferry. Absolutely, that's the vision. That is the problem to solve. We, we know that. However, given today's technology, and we've spent a lot of time with really smart people in the, um, the e-ferry space, you need to have both the technology and the design engineering for the vessel. And candidly, we don't have a lot of space on our vessel for batteries. We're a very low profile vessel. And, um, and so there are just some challenges with that. And the second big, big piece of this is we've got to have the shore side charging infrastructure. You can't just wind up these boats. And that takes some time. So we've had quite a few conversations with PGE. And yes, there's a lot of federal funding coming down the pipeline for um, shoreside charging infrastructure. You can see the ticket um, price. We really want to keep this low. And I think Amy's going to go to the next slide. And then we'll just show you the little animated map just showing you um, between Cathedral Park down to River Place. This is 6.5 nautical miles. The travel time is 25 minutes. And if there's one thing that Amy and I have learned, and for those of you that came out, I know the, our Harbor Master, Sean Whalen's on our call as well today. And thank you for that, Sean, is people getting out on the water on a boat. Most Portlanders and Vancouverites haven't had that opportunity, but how the passage of time feels very different than other mobilities. And we're not trying to diss or take away from any other transit options. We are transit um, enthusiasts. However, being out on a boat, and there's some great research out of the San Francisco Ferry Service that shows if you're on a 25 minute boat ride, it feels more like you know, 18 minutes or so. Whereas when you're on other modes of transit, that 25 minutes actually feels longer. So it, there's just the fun aspect and inspirational aspect of being on a boat out on the water and seeing our community from a very different perspective. And the next slide. And then we did have a press conference this last June and uh, we got a, this is called a general arrangement. So that's the preliminary design that was completed by All American Marine out of Bellingham. So they went ahead and they spent $50,000 
with Technocraft, which is a top ferry design group out of New Zealand to come up with this based on the preliminary specifications we gave them. So we just want everyone to see, yes, in fact, there is a vessel that can be built that will work on the Willamette River. Um, we will be starting the pilot project with a 70 passenger vessel. We plan on keeping basically the exact same boat, but in the future we'll have 100 passenger vessels as well. They'll be a little bit larger. Um, yes, for all of our cycling friends, we absolutely will have personal bike storage on board. Um, yes, we do plan to run the entire fleet fully electrified, maybe with some hydrogen fuel cell um, technology as well to prolong the charge. And um, Amy and I and um, Nina Bird from our board were up and got to climb aboard a, a brand new vessel that just has been sent down to San Francisco that's a hydrogen fuel cell um, hybrid watercraft for the San Francisco market. And then you can see on the far right hand column that one passenger vessel operating six days a week and um, the ticket price. And the next slide. And so this is really the summary of what was in our Federal Transportation Administration grant proposal. We asked for 2.7 million. The total nut is 9.7 million. And, um, and it will be Cathedral Park, existing dock, adding a flexi float. Happy if any of you are curious about that, happy to talk about it. River Place, we really don't need to do much. Um, the home port location, uh, John Sainsbury, our ferry consultant, and I have been talking with a number of different property owners on that, and, and so we're, we're pretty hopeful um, about um, the opportunities there, but we really want something, a place that's going to be kind of central for us, and then we'll also be planning out the, um, the Salmon Street dock, so not building it, but doing a lot of the, the research and design engineering. So. That's really it for me. I see there's some notes um, in the chat box. So we're going to hold those to the end and I'm going to hand the baton over to Amy. Super. Thanks, Susan. Um, so at Frog Ferry, uh, we are not just building a brandy uh, passenger ferry service. We are also building a brand. And uh, this might be unique, especially in the transit industry, but we feel really strongly about building a consumer focused brand. Um, and the reason for this is because branding affects everything that we do internally as an organization and externally. Uh, uh, somebody who just joined, could you please meet? Perfect, thank you. Um, it affects everything uh, that we do externally and all these consumer touch points. Um, so just wanted to start off with a slide that just shows the importance of brand and um, the impact that it can have. Uh, that inner circle there is everything internally uh, facing, everything from how we position ourselves, the culture that we create, uh, the personality and the messaging that we create and the image that we try to portray. And that it extends all the way out to this external layer. So how we interact with consumers and members of the community, everyone from our partners, uh, sponsors, uh, what we do for public relations and the media, the content that we develop that you'll see on our website and in our social media channels, uh, the consumer experience that we create uh, on, on board our vessels and also uh, digitally when consumers are trying to purchase uh, a ticket to ride one of our ferries. And also very importantly, the community relations that we have and the events that we hold to really increase in, uh, consumer and community engagement. So um, when I first started with Frog Ferry last February, uh, there had already been a great deal of work done on our brand platform. Uh, and so it was really easy to come in and just um, do a little bit of work to fine tune it, uh, which we did over the summer with our agency partner, Sockeye. They've been a tremendous partner to us over the last couple of years in helping us to craft our uh, brand platform, uh, which I'll share with you in just a minute. Um, but before we did that, before we fine tune things, we really wanted to hear the voice of the consumer. So uh, we set up to speak with consumers in small focus group formats over the summer. And uh, it was really uh, eye-opening uh, to hear them talk about their hopes, their aspirations for the ferry service, uh, what they expected out of the Frog Ferry brand. Uh, and we took away some great learnings. And I think the, the, the two biggest takeaways that we had um, was first that we have this incredible built-in point of differentiation in, in terms of the river and being on the water itself. 
Um, and that is, is really what contributes to a unique brand uh, and the voice that we're gonna have. Uh, being on the water allows you to see things differently and feel emotions and a sense of balance that you don't really hear people talk about when they talk about uh, riding the bus or the max in Portland. Uh, so we really feel like we have a unique differentiator there. Um, and then the second one was this sense of connection that the water provides. Um, people, when they get on a boat and a ferry, uh, they feel connected to so many different things, uh, to the people that they're writing with, uh, the conversations they're having, the, the views that they're having outside of the window at these beautiful um, vistas and points of nature. Um, and then also connected to the city, seeing the city from a different perspective and viewpoint. So we knew we had all of these wonderful uh, points of connection that we could play up uh, and really uh, have some fun with as we talk about our brand and our brand platform. So the culmination of that work was uh, indeed this brand platform, uh, which is really <laughs> more challenging than it looks to distill down to one page. And I'm gonna dive into each one of these elements uh, separately in just a minute, but I wanna, wanted to share with what it looks like um, from kind of the full one page perspective. Um, so the brand platform is compi comprised of a different number of elements and at the heart there you saw our brand purpose. And this is the why we do what we do. Uh, and this is where we knit it out. Uh, we believe that Frog Ferry creates a more livable community by connecting people to each other, the port region and the natural world. Our brand promise, which is um, really the manifestation um, of our purpose and how we build trust with our consumers and our partners that we engage with, uh, is that we're um, gonna deliver engaging, efficient, and economical public transit experiences. Our brand positioning, which is how we stand out uh, in the hearts and minds of our consumers and how, also how we differentiate ourselves from other modes of transit, uh, is that we bring the joy of the journey. Our brand attributes, uh, which are how we express our brand tone and our personality and things like our messaging and our content that we develop. It's also how we like to consider ourselves as we treat others and um, as a company. And that is uh, we are kind, uh, which means that we're considerate, collaborative and clear. We are confident, uh, which means that we're passionate, adventurous and resilient. And we're smart, which means that we're universal, resourceful, and safe. Our brand contribution is what we physically contribute um, to uh, society. And that is um, being a human-centered transit. And in order for us to be human-centered and really focus and meet human needs, we have to meet these three criteria. And that is being a viable or economically sustainable mode of transit, being feasible, so making sure we have the technological, te technological know-how and that it's um, possible to do, and that it's desirable um, so that it's relevant and easily attainable. And then our brand role, which is what we seek to be on an individual level, um, specifically for the pilot in this initial stage, is to inspire people to think, act, and talk differently about how they utilize everyday Portland transit with a greener and more efficient <clears throat> solution that shows kindness to our environment, region, and each other. When we talk about um, our brand role further out, we really want to, instead of inspiring people to think and act differently, we want to think about us showing more leadership and being the transit authority in the region. And then this last slide is our brand messaging. So this is uh, bringing everything together and um, talking about what we're gonna say about our brand. And this has four key pillars. The first pillar is what we are. And we say that we're transformative public transit. So we're doing this in a number of ways. We're transforming uh, how people get around the region, uh, how, they pe how people feel while they're commuting. So it's not just getting from point A to point B, it's giving them something extra while they're doing that. Um, we're transforming the way that people feel once they get to their destination, um, giving them a little bit of inspiration uh, to go about their day. Uh, we're transforming an overall sense of well being. So, that feeling of balance and calm that people get from the water is something that's unique to us and what we can deliver. Uh, and we're also transforming the expectations of public transit. Uh, from a rational need to do to an emotional get to do. So it's not something that people uh, have to do. They are, they're really wanting to get out on the river and are looking forward to doing that. 
pillar two is, oops, pardon me, uh, is what we do and that's innovate transit to build a more livable community. So uh, we're doing this by reducing greenhouse gas emissions while leveraging the river. Uh, revitalizing the region as a hub for commerce and tourism. So really getting people back into our downtown core, which is something that the city uh, desperately needs. Um, we're leading the region in developing more strategic, sustainable and human centered public transit solutions and ultimately making it possible for people to get where they wanna go and doing it affordably, predictably and inspiringly. Pillar three is, is the how or how we're going to do this. And that's bringing people joy on every journey. And we really want to make it um, delightful and pleasurable to be on the river with our exceptional service and experiences. And Heather's going to talk a little bit about our customer experience plans in just a minute. But uh, we also want to be inspiring for writers uh, with stories and insight about the historic and culture importance of our rivers uh, plays into our experience as well. And we want to bridge humanity to nature. Uh, and lastly, the why we do it. And that's inspiring connections um, leads to inspired arrivals. And I love this uh, pillar. This is my favorite one because I really feel like it is uh, the end benefit of taking our ferry and um, arriving to a new place inspired to do something great that day. Uh, we really want the connections that people have on our rivers uh, to enhance an appreciation for our region while providing an ideal break from life on land and um, connecting them to a smaller personal footprint with access to clean transit technologies and connecting people to each other, the region and the natural world. Hey, so with that- if, if you have your phone not on mute, if you would please oh, mute your phone, it's kind of bleeding through. If everyone would just double check right now, that'd be great. Thanks, James. <laughs> so with that, um, I'm going to uh, hand things over to Heather Lynn, who's going to talk uh, a little bit about our customer experience plans. Great. Thanks so much for all that, Amy. Um, so we've talked quite a bit about customer experience so far, and it really is an extension of a lot of what Amy was just walking through from a brand standpoint. Like the brand, everything that she was talking about is kind of what unifies us both as a team internally, as, as a, running a business and a service, and then that extends out. So we, we were kind of seeing a customer experience thus far as really, okay, what are those core intersections that we have with people? Um, and it's also about building relationship. And that can be very often a function of marketing, um, of you know, social strategies. So a, a lot of those kind of relationship building um, tactics that we see companies using. But we also see customer experiences moving into what does it feel like on a boat? What does it feel like when I'm standing in line? Is there a kiosk? How do I give feedback? Is the staff friendly? So there's just a lot of areas that we're taking a look at to make sure that the customer experience is going to be um, consistent and deliver on the brand promise that we just walked through. So to, to build on this, when we're looking at our experience and we're, we're moving into this planning phase where we're gonna to start to get more and more tactical, we wanna make sure that we have kind of a unifying view. So it's that brand platform and these experience principles. And so what we mean is we're gonna, we're gonna look at our work or look at our effort through this lens. Are we keeping it simple? Are we, are we really being local? And, are we maximizing humanity? Are we making it personal? And so that'll just kind of keep us on us or make sure we stay on point, right? With the experiences that we're, um, we're, built, we're building. I'll tell you a little bit more about the conference we were at, but this picture that you see here was um, just a couple weeks, uh, huh, maybe a month ago in New York for the ferry conference. It was a gorgeous day and it was just so lovely seeing um, tourists and commuters just out and enjoying um, ferry travel. So um, as far as kind of um, on the more tactical side, when we look at journey mapping, um, this will, you know, we're looking at a variety of touch points and that, like I said, it could fall into a marketing, advertising, PR, digital. Um, but at the end of the day, we're wanting to make sure that the customer experience, no matter how or when they interact with Frog Ferry, um, that they're having a, a, a good experience that feels safe and convenient. So we're working on that. And then with the roadmap, you're fine advancing. 
Yeah. Um, so this is just a CX roadmap. I won't go into too much detail, but I know that there's been a lot of questions related to timing and how things nest together. So in the upper, upper right, you see pilot launch. And so um, we're looking at Q2 2023. So in order to do that, there are two primary segments of customer experience that we're really focused on, right? The trip experience. So what is it like when we're boarding? Is there good signage? Um, and is the staff helpful, well-trained, you know, all, all of that. And we're working up to a pre-pilot um, test or test routes, um, test route proofing that happens before we actually do the launch. And another kind of core area is the digital experience. And this is gonna be critical for us making sure that we are you know, very budget conscious. So you, using as much digital as we can, but we also are committed to having, having <coughs> a great focus on equitable access to transportation. So we're not gonna solely leave on, lean on digital. We're gonna be looking at all touch points. It just, digital becomes a very um, primary source of way to deliver. Um, for our customers. So we'll be, um, again, very similar to focusing on that pilot launch. Um, we're going to be doing a refresh on the website. God bless you, ever sneezing. And, um, but we'll also, I have a, the lowest bar in here that says ticketing. Um, for those of you that don't know, that's a major part of what we are delivering. I know there've been questions like, will this have be related to a hot pass or um, can I use cash? Can I buy it on board? And we're looking at the overall customer experience for purchasing um, for the pilot, one route, two endpoints versus the longer term vision. Um, but we will have um, ticketing in place for the pilot, just the complexity or how that's delivered is still being defined. So we've had a couple of activities that we've alluded to. I just wanted to highlight those for um, those of you that are curious as well is, is what's happening is um, in conjunction with a lot of the funding work um, and sponsorships and partnerships and marketing and advertising that Susan and Amy have been talking to. Um, I'm also looking at our overall research strategy. So what, what we're really wanting to take is rather than us saying, here's the service and putting it into Portland, we're actually wanting to hear from people who would be using the ferry. What do you want? What do you expect? Um, what, what feels right for you? What's going to make this a highly valuable addition to your transportation plan, right? And so, for example, we just are launching an OHS survey, OHSU survey that's running right now. It's going to about a thousand employees that are living within the Cathedral Park St. John's area that go to OHSU. And we're really assessing um, their recept receptivity to adding a ferry option to their commute. And we'll be looking at getting those um, results in early January. We'll be then supplementing that into a broader research plan where we'll have additional surveys and um, touch points with with actual potential writers to make sure that whatever we're designing or bringing to market is going to be of high value. We also are doing experience auditing. And so what that means is we're riding other ferries. So the best way to learn about um, best practices, so what's working well or where there are areas for improvement is actually to get out on the water. And so we've been doing that and we're working towards getting kind of a bank of core insights that are going to help inform website refresh, mobile design, sales and marketing, and a variety of other touch points. So that's all in process. And um, the ferry conference that we just went to, um, it, you know, it's, it was um, about 200 people were there, their industry, um, whether they're operators or um, manufacturers the, or city government representatives. It was just a very nice um, broad spectrum of people in um, New York and New Jersey. The location was fabulous because from our from the room where the conference was, we could actually see ferries um, out in the Hudson. Yeah. So um, we also were able yeah. to do some tours there. And I would just say like some of the core themes that we're seeing is everything about electrification and decarbonization. That's top of mind for everybody, whether you're figuring out how, to, how do you build for a electric or how do you retrofit? That's just top of mind, high priority. And we're seeing that more and more. 
Um, safety, obviously this post, I keep saying post COVID, but it all still continues. So it's really about this new normal, right? Um, how we're, we're safely operating ferry service. And it's, it's actually, um, the ferries are, are seeing um, great, great receptivity for people from a safety standpoint, because there is outdoor space and it is um, a much faster way to commute. Uh, they also talked quite a bit about regulatory updates and innovation, um, both technology from a build standpoint as well as operating standpoint and how people are using um, the ferries. So we're learning, we're in this planning phase and it's all feeding into making sure that whatever we are bringing to market is gonna really resonate with people. So thanks for listening. Great, thank you, Heather and Amy. I mean, I. I just know everybody watching this is going, wow. So I am just so loving our team. And honestly, you guys, I have just never been more inspired than working with these two women and was so incredibly proud to be at the Ferry Conference back in New York. And there were about 200 people there. And here are these three women from Portland coming in. And um, I, I think I can say without being <clears throat> braggadocious, uh, a lot of people were talking about Frog Ferry. We just had a lot of attention, a lot of questions from operators, from funders, and from builders. So people are talking about Portland and are pretty excited. And um, candidly, I just spent a lot of time with the website and the updates Amy had made has just added so much to our credibility. And then Heather just really was diving in deep with a number of the questions that she was asking. So moving forward, I think we just have one slide on this, one or two, and it's um, pretty simple for the, the year coming ahead. Simple, but super complex. And so this first one is we really need to get clarity on our business model. And so this public-private partnership that we've been working on, um, it, it's been clunky, I have to say. It's been challenging, and we know here locally, <laughs> Captain Wilcox is nodding. He's been in some of these meetings. Um, you know, we have come in altruistically for, it'll be five years this spring, over and over and over again, meeting with electeds and staff members and um, trying to really respond to their requests for more information, more data, more research. And we've done all that, but we really need um, some champions out there, both um, agency-wide as well as individual electeds to say, yeah, I wanna go ahead and champion this project. And, and if we're not able to do that, and it is in our favor that we have some elections coming up. And so um, all of these electeds will be scrutinized a little bit more for what they've accomplished and what they haven't accomplished. And I know a couple of you on this call are in particular paying attention to that. I won't call you out by name, but it's kind of like enough's enough. We, we really need to, um, to, to get that partnership. Um, we've got to secure funding. I mean, bottom line, it's 9.7 million. This thing isn't going to fund itself. Um, so we're doing a lot of outreach. We've got Darren Golden from our team who's leading government affairs is on the call. And he, he just joined us in uh, July and has just been instrumental in making really great headway with electeds here locally, regionally, state, and on the federal side. Um, and then Amy and I have been working on making um, presentations to different potential corporate sponsors. We've also um, had a meeting about a month ago with the foundation that genuinely seems really interested in providing some funding um, in the new year. So all of that's underway. The operations plan needs to get completed. That's part of the, the STIF, which is the Statewide Transit Improvement Fund grant. That's an ODOT grant that TriMet sponsored us for. So that's the second deliverable. The first one was the project plan, which contained five independent plans within it. We've already delivered that and that's been accepted. Heather's ongoing outreach um, and, and work on customer experience and digital experience. And for any of you on this call that might wanna work with her, um, particularly people that have challenges um, with mobility or um, with medical issues, if you are blind, if you are hearing impaired, we'd love to hear from you and have you be part of our team because it's one of those things we can check the box and say, yes, we're going to be ADA compliant, but we really want this to be driven 
by our the, the passengers and what the needs are there and continuing to refine and evolve our marketing efforts as well under Amy's leadership. And so that's advertising, that's finding really smart partners. And um, Amy pulled together a meeting of 20 business leaders in July and we had a brainstorm session of what are the types of corporate partners with which we want to work, um, not just who's got money and wants to write us a check. So really trying to be very intentional about this. Um, and did I miss anything, Amy? I know that slides off, but I think that that pretty well sums up for this next year. And, um, and for 2022, ultimately, it's all about getting a boat on the water in the spring of 2023. So part of that is getting an RFP out for an operator. We won't be operating ourselves. We don't have the, the infrastructure here, the know-how and just culturally within Portland now. So we'll contract that out, which is what when we were just back in New York, which is what they do. And then an RFP for a vessel as well. And so that's part of our FTA grant application would be a design lease to sell. So it would be a custom made vessel for the Willamette. Yes, we've, we've done some pretty good uh, um, analysis and investigation of what's out there in the market. We'll do a bit more in case a vessel's popped up in the US that might fit the requirements of the Willamette. But candidly, it's pretty doubtful because of our low bridge clearance, the low, ultra low and no wake zones, and also the river debris issues. So with that, I think we really want to open it up to questions. I know that there was, a, well, Amy, did you want to facilitate these? Yes. Um, okay. So if anyone does have a question, please add it into the chat. There are some here already, and I'll just um, throw them out to our team here. Uh, the first one is about sources of payment for people mm -hmm. riding the ferry. Are we going to um, have them be able to pay by credit, debit card, cash, scan card, et cetera? Right, so for the pilot program, it will be um, online um, payment. So, but we're still evaluating, do we also allow onboard payments or not? So that we're not defined yet on exactly what that would be. This also goes into, you know, the next question was about, um, is the card, will the cards be integrated, let's say with HOP? or other Metro options. That's part of the um, partnerships work that we're trying to do to see where is their integration possible or not. And so um, that's definitely something we, we want this to be, you know, part of um, a, a transportation option. So that last mile or the, you know, that that's what we'll be focusing on. So I think integration with other transportation cards or solutions would be fabulous. Great. And then uh, we had another one about the projected cost per ride, Susan. Um, sure. So for the pilot project, we're looking at a $3 price point, um, $2 for honored citizens. We just learned from the FTA. It sounds like this is a new rule that honored citizens, that ticket price must be no more than half of the, the full ticket price. So that's something we're going to be looking at, but we really, really want to make sure for this pilot project that this is accessible and affordable for everyone. I see uh, Darren's made a, a comment about we've got to make sure we're, we can accept cash in some way um, for the sake of, of equity. And right. we've certainly seen that on a number of the services that we've been on in the Seattle markets and the New York markets as well. So um, that's what we're looking at for that for the, the longer term. Uh, vision, we could for a, a longer run, it, it could be, you know, more like a 550. Um, so based on the, the length of time, the length of service, um, and ultimately, it's very simple math, we're looking at the, the total throughput cost of if you are driving a car yourself, you're taking transit, and that time against the ferry service. So we want to provide a really exceptional value, but also understand there is a cost for that transit. And we want to ensure our subsidy is significantly less than other forms of transit. And right now for our pro forma, we're looking at that subsidy being, um, you know, about 250 per seat. Great. 
Thank you. Um, the next one is more of a comment from John Moore. It looks like he was at OHSU today for a couple of different appointments um, and said it would be great to have a ferry ride right off the dock by building one or two. Um, and uh, we couldn't agree more. I know that we're working uh, closely with OHSU. We have a survey uh, going out to them to understand their ridership, specifically from the pilot route from St. John's Cathedral Park uh, down to River Place, which will service uh, OHSU, but uh, definitely something that we know there's demand for and looking forward to that. Uh, the next one, uh, also a comment, hopefully the various real estate people that are marketing the apartments and buildings along the waterfront will be able to add some frog ferry dollars, which will help them. Uh, five of the people contacted that will be good for them. Uh, agree. <laughs> Any other comments you want to add about uh, developments and um, building up uh, uh, demand along the waterfront, Susan? Yeah, John, thank you for that comment. We've met with a number of developers and, um, you know, that's the, the private sector side. They, they want us. And we know of a couple of property owners that they are design engineering uh, new docks now. Um, for some of them, their local residents want to be able to launch kayaks even. So they're just moving far more quickly than some of the, the public sector agencies. So that's why we think we can really have the best of both worlds and be working both with public agencies such as Portland Parks, uh, which owns so much of our waterfront, as well as some of those um, private property developers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then a question here, is there any chance that ODOT will pitch in and help with costs? We certainly hope so. I don't know, Darren, do you, are you available to, to tackle? I, I hate to put you on the spot. Are you available? Yeah, um, ODOT, hmm. That's, that's a hard one. Uh, there's no answer to that yet because I'd be lying if I said I had one. Um, we're working on getting ODOT to work on getting federal money right now because they see there's so much money coming from the federal level and because the state believes and is from a very uh, reasonable standpoint in a deficit uh, following COVID, following wildfires, following economic issues. Um, it's unlikely that ODOT's going to put a ton of money themselves forward, but there is possible routes forward through federal funding. Right, so I think I would just add on to Darren's comment. I think it's $1.2 billion from the infrastructure bill is coming down and primarily being routed through ODOT. And so Soren Garber, who's a wonderful, wonderful volunteer of ours has kind of listened in to a lot of that funding has already been allocated to big, what they call mega projects, but there still are some funds that are unallocated. And so that's where we need to, to go in. I mean, all of this is recent in the last week, even, or for getting this information. So we need to put together our strategy for where there are pockets of opportunities for, for us. Yeah. It's a great question. Looks like um, we have one or two more here. Um, looking out a ways, have we gotten reactions and ideas from the northern end of the Willamette routes like Lake Oswego and Oregon City? Uh, yeah, so we've, for all 10 of those dock locations, we have been talking with who our likely partners are. Um, from Oregon City, uh, we have been working in partnership with Confederated Tribe of Grand Ronde for about four years now. James Paulson has been, you know, in, instrumental in those conversations with them, and they purchased the Blue Heron Mill there, so they have a mixed-use development um, plan for that area, and and I mean, that's the second largest uh falls in north america after niagara falls in terms of volume so of course having a ferry come up and for a sight saying you think of niagara falls which the niagara falls ferry fully electrified ferry right there um and even people getting to and from the hotels for milwaukee uh mayor um i was gonna say uh, mayor but mayor gamba has been a great supporter um, of ours for a long time. I see John nodding. John made that first introduction um, several years ago. And so looking at their, uh, their riverfront park there, they've got a major redevelopment um, in plan. And I, I think they have most of the funding for it. So they're aware of us and we're aware of them. 
they do have the light rail max rail line that's providing pretty good connectivity right now but that's kind of in work um, it's mayor buck is over in lake oswego they actually have two dock locations that could work for us and um, the, the area just adjacent to one of the parks they're planning on really uh, transforming into um, medium income um, um, multi-use uh, apartments and, and for that complex. And so just having density of residents right there next to the ferry stop would be really great for us. So yes, for all of them. And I just heard from the city manager up in West Lynn again. And I have to say West Lynn, they had us come in and present three years ago. They're saying, when we open up those locks, don't forget us. And again, two weeks ago, I heard from them again saying, hey, we're tracking your progress. Do not forget and, and count us out because we want to see a ferry service here in West Lynn. So yes is the answer to that. Mm -hmm. Great. And I know we're just about out of time. We just did, we did have a few more questions that did relate to more funding opportunities, and I'll try and kind of group them all in one question. Uh, we want to make sure we're looking at the WTOT as well as ODOT, um, if somebody could speak to that. Um, somebody made a comment about um, the earthquake situation and potential for um, potential funding from the Oregon Seismic Committee um, or, or OSPAC. Um, and then also PCEF grants, are they a possibility? So those are kind of three funding areas in one question. <laughs> so Bill, I, I'm seeing your comments there in the chat box and really appreciate it. And early on um, met with the engineering team for the, the, uh, the um, Burnside Bridge project um, out of Multnomah County. Um, and even for committee members, um, I'm, they will follow up after they come out of committee and say, hey, we're recommending the ferry. And short term, we think that makes a lot of good sense. Of course, we need docks on either side for that. And that's something we, we could work around. And I have to tell you, every week I'm down there walking the waterfront and kind of going, okay, here's where we could bring in a floating dock or even with the Maritime Museum there. And there, you could actually use that as a barge for access. So that's something we're, we're, we're certainly open to. Um, and then I see the comment from Paul about the, the mega projects and then that funding. And yeah, it's a source of frustration where funding comes down and is just immediately diverted into some of the big projects. And, and candidly, you know, when I worked with like the Port of Portland and big projects were, you know, out there on our radar and needed to be funded. So, you know, we understand a lot of that, but we're just saying, please provide a mechanism for nonprofits like us that have done all the work, that we have significant support behind us, we're operating with facts and data, give us the pathway and the opportunity to tap into some of these funds. And I mean, it's not even pennies on the dollar for what we need. And I think that's one of the things is when you look at mega projects and so many of them have billion dollar price tags and we're like, for 9.7 million, we can stand up two docks, get a third one underway and a vessel in the water. And they're just like, you know, that's just, you know, the kind of change you'd find in your sofa cushions. Um, but we do have the pro forma behind it. So we just got to be able to come in and kind of disrupt the status quo in light of climate, in light of congestion, and rather than just more of doing the same. So we need bridges, we need good highways, you know, we're proponents of that, but we're just saying, please innovate and think a little bit differently for this new mode of transit. Um. And Susan, I think that's uh, all we have time for tonight. Um, do you want to just wrap things up or? Certainly. I am so grateful to each and every one of you for making time. I see so many friends on my screen and I just, I'm sending you a virtual hug. Um, and uh, really the ethos of Frog Ferry is really grounded in your support and your passion behind this. Um, many of you have provided countless hours. I see Shannon holding up her, her heart. I am just, I, I can't say enough about how much, how integral you all are to this initiative. It's really who we are. And I think in hearing Amy and Heather's work on the brand promise and also for the customer experience, 
it's really your voices that we are listening to and taking into consideration for how we approach this. And so it is the frog fairy difference is, is really because of supporters like you. So thank you so much. Please have a very safe holidays. I know this is the fourth night of Hanukkah. So I hope you all are looking forward to a year ahead full of light and we'll look forward to staying in touch with you. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great night. Thanks everybody. Take care now. Bye.